So, and again, thank you. Um, thank you for staying with us despite all the travel disruption. You may be staying for quite some time beyond the conference. I hope not. But, um, but thank you. And let's start then our, our um, discussions with the efficiency discussion about enhancing efficiency in cancer care. So I'd like to welcome onto stage our panelists for that. Um, Faisal Mahmood, who's Vice President of International Development Markets Lead, uh, Pfizer Oncology. Eduardo Pisani, Chief Executive of Orcan International. Eduardo, please, I'll, I'll move aside. Here we are. Uh, Ajay Agarwal is um, this one. It's just I'll sit there. Um, Ajay Agarwal is joining, who's Associate Professor and, uh, of the National Thank Institutes you. for Health Research, Advanced Fellow and Consultant Clinical Oncologist at Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS. He'll be joining us virtually. Hi, Ajay. Um, I'm not sure where the camera is. I'll, I'll wave over there, I guess. Um, hi, Ajay. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and also Ebba Halesio Hult, I pronounced that correctly? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Co founder uh, and lead uh, and head of Vision Zero Cancer. So thank you. Please thank do you. join us. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Let's get straight into it then. Um, enhancing efficiency. Um, full disclosure I'm actually a member of AllCan as well. Uh, an NGO dedicated to efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. So Eduardo and I uh, have spoken at length about it and have been involved in it, but Eduardo, you can tell us what, do, what does all can mean by efficiency in cancer care? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, all can is uh, what I call a think and do tank. So anyone who, is, who thinks and does is welcome to join. Uh, it, uh, obviously focuses in the field um, of uh, cancer care efficiency. And uh, uh, I do remember that yesterday in multiple sessions there have been references to sustainability of healthcare systems and cancer care in particular. There has been a reference to value-based healthcare. And if you will, the concept of efficiency falls straight into this uh, context and, and in this debate. Um, everyone may remember also that there have been striking numbers that have been announced by the OECD in recent years, whereby nearly 20%, approximately 20% of resources dedicated to healthcare are wasted. And of course, this, this is unacceptable. This is something that has to be looked at, and that's something which triggered also the interest in efficiency uh, in, in cancer care in particular. These inefficiencies actually can be found at multiple levels of the system. So it, it's truly uh, a multidimensional challenge that has to be addressed. They exist at system level, at the provider's level and at the patient level. The definition of efficiency as we know it is fairly straightforward and uh, it relates to the uh, relationship between um, resource inputs and intermediate outputs or final health outcomes. However, this notion is very complex to put into practice. And this is why the analysis, the assessment of all these various levels which I have referred to, have brought us to consider that improving efficiency has to be uh, looked at certainly from um, um, wastage perspective. It has to be looked at um, from the perspective of avoiding duplication of labor, but moreover, it has to be looked at um, from the perspective of improving the experience and the health outcomes for people with cancer. Hence, the definition that we have tried to put around this very concept uh, very complex concept, which is that um, efficiency delivers the best possible outcomes using the uh, technological, infrastructural, human and financial resources available 
with a focus on what matters to people with cancer and to society. One thing I would like to immediately highlight and, and I close, um, efficiency is not the synonym of cost containment, okay? It's on the contrary, once again, an opportunity to reallocate or to reinvest in a different way the resources which are available for the benefit of people with cancer and society. And by, by society, I mean the healthcare system as a whole. I think I just, just to give us, because you've, you've spelled out the, the, the sort of overarching mission of all can and how you define it, one or two, I don't want to spend too long on it because we can come back to it, one or two things that all can is actually doing in regard to efficiency, and then we can move on. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm happy to expand on some of the details in a subsequent round, but one thing which is extremely dear to our heart is to measure the um, value and the impact of interventions which are implemented throughout the cancer care pathway and at the various levels which I indicated earlier, at systemic level, patient level, provider level. So metrics and data are the buzzword which makes us really um, focus on outcomes, on how to improve health outcomes. Right. And, and those interventions are, are all sorts of things, service and systems, yeah, yeah. interventions, all yeah, sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll get there. Okay, um, we can go into some of those in, in, in subsequent discussion. Um, Ajay, uh, could I come to you? I mean, <coughs> would you agree broadly with that definition? And then, I guess, what do you see as some of the priority areas for improving efficiency? Yeah, no, thanks for that. Hello, everyone uh, here from London. Uh, so I think, first and foremost, I completely agree. And I think, actually, to start off with good news, I absolutely think, as we speak now, we could be reducing the cost base for what we're the treatments that we're delivering and the care we're delivering and also improving quality. But I think we need a paradigm shift in how we think of cancer care and see it as a systems issue. You know, fundamentally, if we diagnose people earlier, we give them the right treatment and optimise that treatment. It's harder than we say, but actually that can also improve the quality and also reduce our cost base. And I think there are four key areas that I would like to discuss and uh, delve into as we go on further. But I think the first and foremost is performance. Second would be research. Third is the design of the health system. And fourth of all is the use of value frameworks. Just to give a bit more context with regards to performance, I think we lack an adequate performance culture for radiotherapy, systemic therapy and surgery. In the UK, what we've implemented is an outcomes reporting program at the hospital where patients, clinicians, policy makers can actually see what the outcomes of radiotherapy care is for prostate cancer, systemic therapy for bowel cancer, and see that variation. What's interesting, actually, when you delve deeper is that the difference between the best and worst performance isn't actually technology. It's actually quality assurance. And this is something that the profession has to get a grip on, benchmarking, et cetera. The surgeons have been doing this since the early 90s, cardiac surgery, et cetera. But in cancer care, we're just at the cusp and we need to improve that because you can go from 20 percent toxicity rate to others having a 2 percent toxicity rate. That's a massive difference. And it's the same cost base. People not getting admitted people not needing those extra interventions and having better quality and reducing the cost of the health system. Second element, research. 50% of our research is focused on biotech, genetics, systemic therapies, biomarkers. Only 3% is on implementation science and health services research, and about 5% is on early diagnosis and screening. I don't believe if we didn't adjust those percentages that we wouldn't have any improvements. Implementation science, for instance, only 50% of the technology that we actually develop actually gets to patients, and that's technology that works. We have huge inequities, and we're still diagnosing people at too late a stage. And it's been shown if we diagnose patients at stage one or two disease, it's much cheaper for the health system, better for the patient than it is if we're diagnosing patients at later stage. Those are easy wins, but the portfolio is misbalanced from that perspective. And then the third one is health system design. Whether we like it or not, we're in healthcare markets, even in social health insurance systems as in the Netherlands, UK tax funded, and then we know a sort of more formal market in the US and globally. But actually what we fundamentally lack, market is meant to drive quality and reduce costs, but we have such profound information asymmetry. Even in the 
countries that are providing CAR T, all these innovative technologies, we can't even provide outcomes and the information that patients need and clinicians need to actually drive system performance. It's embarrassing. We don't invest in the infrastructure needed to do so. Um, the other element is where we put services, centralization. It's not sort of back of the envelope stuff. This can actually be done with models testing the trade-off between travel burden, equity, what are the capacity impacts, and what's going to happen with performance. We've got the we've actually shown that we can do this with the information we have available. So we make too many excuses that, oh, someone does this. This is the social sciences. This is health systems research. This is things that we can use day to day. I think the final thing is that we need to help policymakers, patients and clinicians to make adequate decisions. And I'm going to say that from a radiotherapy hat on. We have many silos of care. You go to one country and even within that country, different regions saying, oh, yeah, we love brachytherapy. Oh, we love SBRT. Oh, we love CyberKnife. And actually within the community, we don't decide properly how are patients meant to know, how are regulators meant to know what they should reimburse? What happens as a result? We don't get the things that we think we should be accessing. And equally, we probably spend too much on care or value. So within the ESTRO, um, I'm co-chair for the Health Economics and Radiation Oncology Group, we're actually developing a value-based framework, which does precisely that. This is a transparent process for understanding, look at the technology, what's the benefit, what is the evidence, and what is this going to meaningfully mean for patients and their costs? So I think it's all about changing hearts and minds, but as we stand today, these are things that could be implemented overnight, potentially. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's very useful as a framework for thinking about this 20 to, I mean, 20% was the low end of the estimate, wasn't it? I went up to 40, I think, WHO yeah, and OECD. Um, anyway, this vast uh, wastage within our health system. So I think that's a nice four-point framework for how we might address some of that wastage and the unwarranted variations in, in care. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Faisal, I'll come to you next. Uh, when we spoke earlier, you were talking really about how our experiences with COVID-19, yeah, un un unfortunately, sometimes it takes crises, what often takes crises, to deliver um, changes to the way we do things, per force of, of the crisis, it allows us to take risks that we wouldn't otherwise take, I suppose, and for cultures to shift. So perhaps you could expand on what you mean by how that experience might impact our, our approach to efficiency in cancer care ongoingly. Sure, absolutely. And first of all, thank you for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here and pleasure to be seeing you in person and then everyone in person. My name is Faisal Mahmood. I'm a physician working in uh, Pfizer Oncology. I have 20 years experience in drug development, mostly late phase drug development. And really, I suppose my role to advocate for the role of industry in creating efficiencies within cancer treatment and how we can translate learnings from what we have seen from the COVID pandemic, both therapeutics and vaccines for COVID, but also how we've operated to try and develop cancer medicines within the COVID paradigm. I think there's a lot of insights there that we can translate uh, and can be applicable to the actual delivery of healthcare. I suppose the first question people may be wondering is, well, okay, what's, what's, what is a, you know, a pharmaceutical physician talking about efficiencies in cancer delivery? And for us, um, you know, the reason why I'm still here in industry is to try and translate scientific breakthroughs into effective cancer therapies. And the most important part of being an effective cancer therapy is that it actually gets to patients, and it gets to as many patients as quickly as possible. And so we have a, you know, and, and these medicines are highly, highly precious to us, as you can imagine. Me working in late phase development, a large proportion of the medicines that I work on do ultimately get through the regulatory process. But for the early phase developers, very few of those ultimately get through. I remember working on angiogenesis inhibitor, and when I told the person who discovered it in the lab that we've got it through, he wrote to his mum saying, after 25 years, we finally have something that's got into the clinic. The point I'm trying to make here is um, these medicines are really, really precious to us, and as we evolve from discoverers and developers of innovative medicines to partners in the delivery of healthcare, industry, I think, has a really important role along as a, in, as a stakeholder to get these medicines to as many pay patients as possible, but also translate learnings of how we can develop these medicines and what we have adapted during the COVID pandemic of how to develop these medicines into actually delivery of healthcare. So we have seen, and I've got the experience of uh, my own father who was on adjuvant, three years of adjuvant uh, therapy after cancer before and then during the pandemic of how he interacted with the healthcare system, and it quite mirrors 
quite nicely of what we did from a clinical trials perspective. In clinical trials, we have very rigid regulatory frameworks of how patients need to be evaluated, how they need to come to hospital to do things, how they are, how they are informed around the clinical trials, where those clinical trials take place, and what happens to them during the follow-up uh, process. This creates huge inequities in terms of the types of patients who can actually get into these trials, where they live, and the diversity in terms of their representation is just not there. Now with the COVID pandemic, one thing that we have seen quite dramatically is you can flex quite importantly with the help of a lot of technology, the types of patients and how they can be enrolled in clinical studies. You can get the protocol to the patient rather than patient going to the protocol. And this is creating a much more diverse, more representative patient populations which ultimately will create efficiencies in the cancer treatment pathway because what we have seen is outcomes in clinical trials and often translate into real-world effectiveness, and often that is because of the lack of diversity within clinical trials. That is now being reduced. We have an important role in translating that into real-world effectiveness, and this includes very obvious things such as remote monitoring, remote engagement, patients going to centres which are not the clinical trial centre but maybe the local primary care service for blood tests, care closer to home, maybe having the blood tests done at home. And so I think some of these out-of-the-box solutions can be quite important and, and the reason why I'm so passionate about this is while I'm still working in the, in the hospital, two things which really made me think out-of-the-box solutions uh, are, are really important especially as it relates to efficiency in cancer care. One was there was a big hoo-ha for the CEO of the hospital I was working in where he had a pool of money and all the different departments were advocating for the pool of money and showing how this can create efficiency in their department. Ultimately, he gave that money to the local subway station to fix the escalator because what was happening is they didn't have enough money to fix the escalator. Patients were then falling off and breaking their hips and coming into A&E, but just... By giving them that money, it dramatically reduced the input into the A&E, which then released other funding. So that's just one way of thinking about it. And the second one, and the last point I'll make is, working in hospital, I was in charge uh, with an audit to see what, are the, what is the lowest hanging fruit that we can do to improve outcomes for the cancer patients <laughs> in the local community. And everyone was expecting, and I was working in radiation oncology at, the, at that time, was a new type of medicine therapeutic or you know, uh, maybe a, 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 you know, more radiotherapy machines, et cetera. Ultimately, the conclusion we came on was training more radiation uh, technologists because that was the single biggest blocker of how we can deliver our current existing therapies with existing capacity. So, so I think this just gives a flavor of some of the learnings that we can have. So actually thinking about what ties together what we've heard from the three of you, and I'll come to you, Eva, with the conclusion of this, is a sort of, you've all said slightly different things, but there's systems thinking involved in what all you're all saying. It's the idea of looking uh, at the, the whole pathway, but also the inflow, the outflow, the workforce along that pathway, um, where value could be eroded along that pathway. And it could be in quite counterintuitive um, areas or, or places that need a bit of thought before you need anal analysis and thought, hence the need for data and a performance culture. Ever that, that clearly needs a spirit of collaboration from between escalator operators and builders, but more, more regularly, I, I guess, from the people involved directly in the, in the pathway of care. So who needs to be involved? How is that collaboration brought about? Mm -hmm. uh, in Sweden, we started an initiative to try to answer that question, who needs to be involved? And this is ever expanding because more types of people needs to be involved. Uh, so um, we, we all talk about this, as I said, the, the importance of collaboration and aligning around the common goal and setting a roadmap together and create the governance structure around the patient at the center, the citizen at the center, or the end user, but then of course aligning it with the healthcare, all the stakeholders of the healthcare systems, of course the, the healthcare uh, professionals, uh, uh, the researchers or the academia, of course the life science industry and other colliding industries or conjunction industries, and also of course the regulators and the payers. You need to find new ways of, of co-designing and deciding on what, what system do we want to have where are the different hurdles or blockers? They can vary from one 
um, country or health system or regional, national to another, of course, but somehow redesigning the, those pathways together. So uh, I think now we have a great momentum, of course, to deliver on the Europe Speeding Cancer Plan through cancer mission hubs that we are about to create. Some have already done it, others are doing it. And we created a prototype for that now as soon as working with mission-oriented principles, learning a lot in collaboration between the different stakeholders, all bringing their knowledges and perspectives to the table. And from there also deciding on what has to be done. And in, in Sweden, for instance, we have started initiatives where we see or where we can enhance efficiency and also then bringing it uh, further out. And we just started to, uh, decided to start out, out in lung cancer where we saw both the opportunities uh, with the new, um, new treatment possibilities, combination of treatments, but also thanks to the uh, possibility of earlier detection in primary care, but also through implementation of a screening program, we could actually uh, um, go towards a, a potential cure and, and definitely improve survival rates. So we decided to start off in something like that. And actually, lung cancer has become a model diagnosis also for us to, to move to more towards the, the precision health, with the precision diagnostics and treatment as it has emerged, going from sort of one or two diseases to 20 different. So how you align around that, and then you can also then uh, define the initiatives where you see the gaps and hurdles. We see a lot of course blockers also when it comes to capacity and training. We can't um, use enough, for instance, our radiation therapy because of lack of uh, technicians, for instance. So there can be different blockers that you need to solve together. But most importantly, also finding ways of using existing resources also in, in this novel landscape of personalized medicine. So um, we've created a, a test bed for uh, precision medicine, where we are aligned all these stakeholders, of course, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, medical device technologies, radiation therapy, of course, um, imaging, uh, different AI solutions, but also then co-designing now together with uh, the uh, clinicians from comprehensive cancer centers, together with uh, the regulators and the payers, a novel um, program for more drug re rediscovery protocols. So we created a Dutch Nordic trial network so that we can build on also using existing resources, using drugs that have been already approved for other treatments, okay. and, and through that also finding new ways of, of treating patients while also then exploring and screening and then finding new clinical trials for also the new developments. So there can be a lot of win-wins by just creating a system where you have build a new forms of governance mechanisms together and the trust to move ahead. Thank you. Eduardo, yes? Yeah. If I may build on, on yeah. what Eva was saying, um, there is one thing that Olcan has been doing now for years, which is to collect case studies, good practice, if you will, in uh, what we call the efficiency hub. And uh, uh, it's on the website, so you can easily find all the case studies. We now have got something like 44 uh, examples from all over the world and covering the whole cancer care pathway. And the reason why I think that EBA's examples are particularly important is in the fact that there are initiatives, there are activities happening in many countries around the world and in Europe uh, particularly, which are um, breakthroughs, which are truly innovative when we look at the um, improved efficiency of cancer care. Now, these case studies in our case have been categorized in, in seven groups, in fact, in order to try and understand what are the lessons that we can learn, what are the the trends also that emerge across uh, multiple initiatives that are, that are taking place. And in, just to give a few examples of these seven categories that have been identified through the analysis, one has got to do with uh, reduced uh, diagnosis delays. This is a fundamental area for further improvement and engagement. There is another 
category which relates to bringing care closer to home. And the third, which I would like to use as an example, is what is now commonly known as a cancer care navigator, uh, which helps patients understand how to navigate their uh, care pathway um, and also receive as appropriate multidisciplinary uh, medical support. Now, I also remember that earlier this morning there were a couple of examples that fit precisely with this um, criteria and these sort of parameters of reference which I'm trying to give. There was an example from, from Spain um, um, regarding breast cancer and the ability also to create um, via digital applications an opportunity to um, collect the questions, the concerns from patients and provide answers through digital platforms. Another example from Belgium, if I remember correctly, regarding a tumor board, and the tumor board, which also is a digital platform that brings closer to the people with cancer or their families certain information, certain um, guidance as well on how best to navigate uh, their, uh, their care. Um, and, and they're not always high tech into in, 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 uh, exactly in exactly so exactly. Going on about, which is innovation <laughs> has to be thought of in as a broad concept. Yes, yes, exactly. Ebba, you want to say something? Oh, please prepare your questions while I. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll come to Mark, but Ebba. I just want to say also that innovation is so much also about innovating the ways we work and the uh, introducing new working principles, and not only thinking of of the the technologies. And I think one of the greatest challenges that we have, I think, in, in every country now is staff shortage and also staff burnout. out. We need to find ways to cope with that so that it's possible to, for the uh, healthcare professionals to have a meaningful work with, mm. with meaningful outcomes for their patients, but also having the right and the authorities in doing while also making sure that we have efficient guidelines and processes and, of course, working with mm. uh, harnessing everything that enables the system to move forward, but also being able to, to retain and make it attractive mm. to work in healthcare. And also new professions needed for, uh, to, to cope with all the, the different possibilities that we have now. Mm. Ajay, I'm aware you're at a disadvantage because I can't read your body language so easily. So if you want to chip in, stick your hat. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right. Um, Mark? Straight away, give AJ a chance to uh, come in. Hi, AJ. Um, no, just Hi. what AJ says is absolutely right in relation to implementation. We're not very good at doing implementation. We don't invest in implementation, and we need to, because otherwise all the breakthroughs that we have are not going to actually go to follow through and actually deliver for our patients. And um, just I'm going to do a plug here as well. Next week, we're going to launch the Lancet Oncology European Grand Shock Commission on Cancer Research. And two of the areas that we're focusing on that need much more attention are implementation science and health services research. Um, but AJ, I think particularly in radiotherapy, uh, one of the things you highlighted there is really important. And I, I suppose I'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts on, on how radiotherapy can show the way for other disciplines going forward. Yeah, um, thank you. I think threefold, really. Uh, one, we, we've always just thought of it, oh, well, we, you know, we, we get the recipe from a trial and we deliver that recipe and that will be all that matters. But we've seen across the NHS 55 centres that that same recipe, so no one was doing anything wrong, results in a differential of 2% severe GI toxicity to 25%. When you do the benchmarking, what you realize, the centers doing the best performance weren't actually integrating any new technology. It was 101 quality assurance. It's that determination to always push the boundary for improving quality, reducing margins, using better imaging, et cetera. So I think first and foremost, within radiation oncology, just proves it's not just about surgery. Radiation oncology, we've done similar for systemic therapy. I think second of all, the way we could lead the way is about in implementation, you can do implementation trials. What's the big watchword at the moment? AI, auto contouring. We don't need radiation oncologists. We can just automate it with computer algorithms. I'm hopeful 
However, we also need to test it. We need to test it in different countries, in different contexts with planning systems, workforce, and we need to see if it translates into cost effectiveness. So I'm chief investigator of the archery study, which is a global study of AI in three tumor types, head and neck, <coughs> cancer and prostate. And that's uh, going to start recruiting from February, but purely to see, is it cost effective? Does it save people's time? Is it actually implementable as opposed to, this is wonderful, we need to start using it now. Um, and I think the third of all is actually, I think within our communities, and we do work within communities, I'm a clinic oncologist, so I give systemic therapy as well, but I can see how it's us against them, and we don't think of it as a comprehensive cancer service, but I think within our own communities, medical oncology, radiation oncology, um, and surgical oncology, we need to understand how can we deliver better value. Let's be honest, if something's not particularly good or deliver value, we have to do so, but there's a lot of branding and reputation, and we need to start with first principles with the patients in mind and move forwards in terms of integrating that technology in a sustainable way. Any further, any other questions from the floor? Oh yes, gentleman here. Hello and thank you for the speech. I want to ask how can we tackle with the several conflicts of interest uh, that may appear during the period of transition to a more efficient pathway? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so conflicts of interest, um, that, that we, particularly around collaboration. I mean, an example that I can think of is sort of when, with, especially with complex therapies like CAR-T, et cetera, there's, there's, there's a service, and, um, service delivery element to a, a pharmacotherapeutic. And how does, a, how does an industry partner get near the patient without... That's one example, but maybe you had others in mind. But there's always going to be conflicts of, of interest uh, when people want to participate in a, in a, in a pathway of care. No, absolutely. absolutely. Um, but I think now we're in a, in a world where there's so much transparency in data and outcomes, uh, you're not making false promises and you're not making a false intervention. Whatever intervention, be it a surgical intervention, a radiotherapy intervention, a medicine intervention, more and more we're being asked, particularly in national payer systems, to prove the outcomes that, that you, we are getting and to show the capacity building that needs to be done in order to put that input mm -hmm. in. The granularity in terms of medicines, optimizations, et cetera, is there that sometimes we do pay for performance for a lot of these and not in very crude measures, but in quite specific measures, including, I think, in the not too distant future at the community level. Uh, at the national level, how we can, how your therapeutic can improve the overall, com you know, community outcome that, of, of interest. Um, so a decade ago, 20 years ago, it was much more difficult. These conflicts of interest, it was much more around trust, but now it's trust and verify, and I mm -hmm. think um, that's where we're going. Any other, so from your experience with... Yeah, yes, I was just thinking also that it requires now a shift in our mindset and culture. I think we are often more having a fear of conflicts of interest rather than understanding what are the drivers for each party, what will everybody bring to the table, and how can we solve it. So I think part of implementation science is also now about moving towards new standards for collaboration so that we can actually co-design, co-create, so mm -hmm. going forward... And, enhancing this efficiency. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I may, virtually in every debate, public debate on health data and collection, sharing, access to health data, one of the buzzwords is trust, which perhaps uh, speaks also to the idea of conflict of interest. And this reminds me always of a New Yorker cartoon which many may remember, in God we trust, all other bring data. Uh, and that means that, in essence, we should be working towards the implementation of a data-driven learning system, which feeds itself on all the, the evidence, on the relevant data which are collected throughout the pathway and uh, improves by learning. So that's really one of, um, I think, yeah. the, the fundamental revolutionary changes that needs to be, that needs to take place. Although that too, AJ, I'll come to you in a second, but that too requires a governance framework that, uh, that addresses the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the question uh, of conflict of interest. Because if you want all partners to be looking at that data or feeding into the data, 
the interests are not going to be all convergent, are they? So that, that needs um, careful thought. AJ, yes, you wanted to come in on this question. Yeah, no, it was just uh, because it was moving towards the importance of stakeholders, but we have to understand that these are hard questions and we need to be multidisciplinary. And I can say that from with my academic hat, that we have these huge public health schools with people in health economics, implementation science, yeah. geography, who deal with healthcare issues, but then don't actually sit at the table to discuss actually... These are fundamental issues with efficiency. We can look at the research design like this or an implementation problem like why we need to do qualitative research. So I think we need to be multidisciplinary in the way we think about the methods to actually tackle some of these major problems. Otherwise, we'll constantly discuss rather than getting to the heart of the matter. So it was just to, put, to make sure that, the, that those, those parties are also represented in those, these discussions. And I'm, I'm, I mean, we're not working from a blank slate here. I mean, there are examples where we've kind of done this sort of stuff and we've worked out governance principles, aren't there? I mean, does anyone want to address or sp speak to that? I can just give an example also, also from, from an implementation science and innovation perspective. What is good is also to create uh, innovation milieus where you can actually test things before you scale them. So you can work with an hypothesis or in these sandboxes or a test bed or of some kind. And that's what we've done now for precision health that we are then trying to co-design with patients, payers, regulators, health econom economists, uh, partners like AstraZeneca, Electa, Roche and others in Sweden see, okay, how can we then design the new studies and okay, and let's try then a new payment model. What could it look like so that we can shape something from the beginning and see if, if it flies? So trying to build something that eventually will help to transition to, to personalized medicine as a form of routine care from the more local great initiative to something bigger. But we can also be a, like a trusted space together. Mm. And if it doesn't fly, okay, then we have to change it and adapt it. So kind of a prototyping before yeah. you scale. Yeah. I mean, and I'll shamelessly plug the efficiency hub again. I mean, there are examples where some of these conflicts of interest have been overcome in some of those efficiency examples, right? So, um, anyway, just, we, uh, sorry, just Adria. to add quick, yeah, just to add quickly in terms of the governance. So, I mean, we're obviously have the benefit from the National Health Service in a sort of single payer, but yeah. actually we've started the outcome reporting. I mean, that's the fundamental thing, which is about outcomes, but very few communities do it or proms. Mm -hmm matter but actually the way it's worked in the uk and that's helped is that these have been mandated by the government so these are national audits set up by the government that actually if people are outliers in terms of performance they have to feed back as the care quality commission will say why your outcome's not good enough what is actually happening? we need to do benchmarking so i think the governance needs to come from the top to also support that data infrastructure mm, okay um, we've got about three minutes left, so um, if it's a question, it has to be really quick, and the answers have to be really quick. Otherwise, I will ask something, which is, if there was one thing that you could say, because a lot of the examples we're talking about have been, I'm caricaturing slightly, but idiosyncratic, rather than we've systematized an approach to efficiency. Um, uh, how do we move, what's the kind of key thing? Is it the culture thing, or is the culture can, does that have to be driven first by a good data infrastructure? What, what comes first to really systematize the idea of, 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 of a learning health system and, and building efficiency into cancer control? Yeah, uh, if I may, yeah. um, I, again, I start from the principle that what gets measured gets done. Uh -huh. And uh, there are also other elements which need to be taken into consideration, that is to say, how we measure and what we measure. Therefore, one of the answers, I hope, um, to your question is that the fact of defining a core set of standards to measure efficiency, to measure value of interventions throughout the cancer care pathway could be a very important common denominator across cancer care services. And I mention, I would like to refer to the exercise, the analysis, the study that we have undertaken that we call the efficiency metrics study that has delivered 137 metrics which uh, derive from clinical practice, real-world evidence, cross-tumor, and have been uh, actually boiled down to eight uh, core metrics which fundamentally respond to 
um, to the expectations mm. of people with cancer. Uh, one, well, maybe... We'll, we'll, I think just let yeah, we'll, we'll sure. pass it. No, no, Thanks, yeah, yeah, yeah. if that's okay. Uh, yes. yes I, I would like to add on to what um, Eduardo said, like if, if uh, the measuring the outcomes and having data and the quality registers to transparency is like a hygiene level on that you build a new type of leadership and organization so that you can move bottom up and top down to actually uh, enhance uh, efficiency and, in, and improve the learning healthcare system. Uh, for me, it's patient activation. Uh, my passion within drug development is patient-centric drug development, genuinely getting patient insights and educating patients in a precision way that they become activators so they can navigate the health system, they can understand yeah. what to look out for from a side effect perspective. All patients are different um, uh, within a, a community, but also diversity in that clinical trials is really, really important. And if we can activate patients, that will help solve a lot of these efficiency problems in our view. Hey Jeff, last word to you. Yeah, no, I agree with all the points. I think what I would sum it up is you don't know what you don't know. And we have to learn better that actually efficiency is an issue. It's something that can be investigated and we can implement solutions. And all everything we've talked about, there are papers to look at and review, but actually we need to educate the community and it starts across the board. And I think then we can start to actually target these areas much more efficiently. Okay, fabulous. Look, thank you so much. It was far too short a time for a far too large a topic, but hopefully we've made progress on it and we'll be revisiting it in future sessions. So yes. thank you very much indeed. That's fab. Thank Great. You. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.